how many of you, you've obviously all seen the ice cream balance. So what are you looking for with R squared? Opposed to one. Is R squared on point six acceptable? Too low. Divide. R squared on point four. Would that be good? Okay, that's all bullshit. Total bullshit. The reason is, give me a vector of x, give me a vector of y, without even fitting a model, I can tell you what r squared is. Isn't that ridiculous? Without even fitting the least squared model, give me a vector of x, give me a vector of y, I can tell you what r squared is going to be. So now, an r squared value of 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, doesn't mean very much, because there's no model to it. Okay? Let's take a look at why that is. Let's understand what's going on over there. Let's understand what we should be taking out of R squared. Let's understand where R squared breaks down and what a better alternative is. So that's where we're going to end up with. But uh, to get there, let's understand where we get our object and how we squares model from. We said last class we're going to vary our values of E0 and E1. So here's my goal and then I vary values of P0 and P1, and I'm going to find those two values that get me the minimum point of that. And because it's a convex objective function, so f of P0 and P1 is a big messy quadratic, that is messy because this expands out into many terms, one term for every data point that I have, so that quadratic gets quite large. But I've only got two search variables, P0 and P1. And People taking 4G, you know that if you take the partial of f with respect to your two search variables and set that equal to zero, that's where your optimum is. So at the optimum df db0, df db1 will find me where the optimum is. I can guarantee that that optimum is indeed a minimum by taking the partial of the, the second derivative with respect to b0 and b1 and verify that those are positive. That way I'm guaranteed that I'm at a minimum. So that's standard from, uh, from, your, from your optimization course. Let's not do the math here. Let's just accept that this is the partial derivative of the A. You're welcome to verify that after the class yourself. And so we set that equal to zero, and I simplify these two equations. Two equations, two unknowns. I can solve for B0 and B1 analytically. So this is why we like the B squares objective function, because it's easy, easy, easy to compute B0 and B1. B0 is simply the average of y, data vector, minus B1, the average of x. Okay, so if this whole problem, I need B1 first before I calculate B0. So B1, then, B1, I just go to my raw data, subtract every x point from the mean, subtract every y from the mean, take the product of that and sum this. Hang on, doesn't this look like covariance we saw last class? Then in the denominator, x minus x bar, sum square goes, take the ratio of that, get b1. Once I've got b1, go ahead and calculate that with b0. But take a note of the structure here, very similar to what we saw last time. <coughs> so there's a solution to it, uh, just written back up again. And I here started to introduce a bit of matrix form and preempting what we're going to see after the midterm break. We're going to move over to matrix form. So just putting that out there for you as an aside. Don't worry if it's not on your slides at the moment. Uh, we're going to get to that next week. It's just to kind of point you there. But what I do want to emphasize is the following. Notice here that this is also in the form of my model. Y bar, I could write. That first line is y bar is equal to b0 plus b1x bar. <coughs> Notice my b squares model is y is equal to b0 plus b1x. So this first equation up here, just rearranged, tells me my least squares model will always pass through the mean of the x data and the mean of the y data. Graphically, if you want to take a look at that, if I've got plot of x and the plot of y. I have my data that I used to fit the model. Whatever x bar is over there, that b squares line will pass through this fictitious point x bar y bar. So you may not have a data point, you know a data set that corresponds exactly to x bar and y bar, but 
what will happen is your least squares line will pass identically through that little point. In fact, it's the pivot point for this system. So that point is on the line without error, x r and y bar. Well, the assignments three are available here at the front afterwards. So that's one thing we, we can take home from that um, equation over there. We can also derive, we, I don't want to spend time doing this, this is not a statistics or a math course, so there's no, no sense in doing it, but you can easily show that the sum of the errors adds up to zero. So I simply go every residual and sum that vector, not the sum of squares, just the sum of the absolute, or the sum of the individual residuals, EI, some are positive, some are negative. The sum of them will sum up and cancel each other out to get you a total of zero. That's great, because one of the objectives with the least squares model is we wanted our expected value of the residuals to be zero. And that's exactly the, the expectation of the residuals equals zero. That implies the sum of EI divided by N is equal to zero. Well, our least squares model, you can prove in these two equations here, at least the sum of EI will equal zero. So that numerator will work already be zero. We've already discussed point number two. Point number three is an interesting conceptual issue here. It says that if we calculate the correlation of x with y, so we spoke about correlation last class, that's why I covered correlation first. The correlation of x, sorry, of x with the residuals, I should say, is equal to zero. That implies that the raw data x are totally unrelated to your residuals, your errors. There's no information in the residuals that's already in the errors. So that's another way to interpret a correlation of zero, is that these two vectors are independent of each other. There's no co-relationship. They're uncorrelated. There's no information in the one vector that's in the other vector. There's no link, possible link between these. All equivalent ways of stating that mathematically in English. The other point is uh, there's no correlation either between the predicted y's on the residuals. We're going to make use of this in a minute in this morning's class, or later on, I should say, where the predicted values of y are totally unrelated to the residuals. There's no information in the residuals that's remaining in the predictions. And then finally, notice that the estimate of b0 depends on b1. We cannot calculate b0 until we've got b1. That means any error that's in b1 and if B1 is calculated with error, this, you never can calculate beta 1, our population parameter. We don't know that. So we estimate it with B1. B1 has a certain confidence interval, a certain amount of error. That error in B1 gets propagated over into B0 as well. Okay, so we'll talk about that a bit more after the midterm break. Here's some things that you're very comfortable with, I'm sure. The units of B1 and the units of B0. Well, the units of B0, quite clearly from this first equation over here, are the same units as Y. Clear, your intercept has got the same units of Y. That's, that's even more obvious from the graphical construction. That interpretation of this point, B0, same units of Y. The units of B1, the slope, is change in Y over change in X. So there again, makes sense. But let's take a look at it in terms of that gas cylinder example. In the gas cylinder example, I was trying to predict my pressure in the cylinder as a function of B0, which I know to be zero, so let's just set that to zero, plus B1 times the temperature. Let's say I found B1 equal to B5, and it has units of Y divided by units of X. So always, always write your slope and intercept with units. Do not omit the units. What is the interpretation of that phi value? Not a trick question. The R squared is a trick question, but what's the interpretation of this phi? Yeah, what does it mean to be phi? What can we say about that phi? If you had to explain to your boss what the least squares model means, P is equal to 5 times T. Your boss would like, well, what that 5? 
Okay. Um, an increase in one degree Kelvin will lead to five Pascal degrees. Exactly right. So let's word it as a statistician would word it. An increase in one Kelvin in temperature will lead to an expected increase of five Pascals in pressure. So always add that an expected. So one degree increase in temperature, one Kelvin increase, will we expect to see a five Kelvin increase in pressure. We'll talk about interpretations and have to interpret these coefficients quite a bit more in the, in the next assignment and in the classes coming after this. And then one final interesting thing that uh, sometimes pops up here, and really why I emphasize this is to show you how robust the least squares model is in terms of calculation. Like Excel, I bet none of you have ever had Excel crashing when you're calculating your least squares model. Okay, and here one reason is because it's a convex function, these V0 and V1s always exist, they're easy to calculate, but there is one instance where the model will break down. And that's when you can get your denominator for V1, can I somehow make that denominator equal zero? Right, so when every single x value is equal to the average, what does that mean what, visually, geometrically, what does that look like? It's a nonsensical model. So here, it means my data are stacked up vertically. So every x is equal to x bar. So if every x is equal to x bar, you try to fit a least squares model to that, your slope is infinity. Okay? So you're dividing through by a zero here, and you'll get an infinite slope. So that's the only time that the least squares model will fail. As long as there's variability in your data, even if this one data point is shifted minutely over to the left, now it will fit a slope that's non infinite. So, least squares model will always converge, always give you reasonable values, except for that trivial, trivial failure point. <coughs> okay, so here's, here's an example that I uh, want to work through vector of x, a vector of y. Calculate the model parameters v0 and v1. Visually, those data look like that, so we expect a positive slope, we expect an intercept that's somewhere around here in the order of three or four. I've calculated some values for you. Now, this is totally artificial. I will never ask you in a midterm to calculate these things x bar, y bar, sum of squares of these deviations. What a waste of time. Well, it's always going to be given this information if you need it. So here, we've got our x data, we've got our y data. I've never asked you, given this x and y, calculate the model. That's, uh, that's trivial and, and silly. So let's take a look here. Calculate x bar, calculate y bar, calculate the sum of squares, calculate the sum of the deviation squared, and then sub in the values to get your slope and intercept. So sub in those into these formulas over here. We know x bar, y bar, we know these deviations, you can calculate your slope. So if you wanted to do this by hand, that's the approach you, you, you use. <coughs> so what I'm going to focus on in today's class is I want to get to this point where we really understand what R squared is and understand the model's capability. All of that, we use this fancy term to make it sound important, analysis. So analysis of a model is what is the model doing, how is it performing, what part of the model is, is error, what part of it is systematic, what is the signal, what is the noise. Those are all equivalent ways of stating the same thing. Then after the midterm break, we're going to come to this very important step number four and five. But we do need to understand steps one, two, and three. Steps four and five, in order to understand this, we have to make a fair number of assumptions. Up to now, we've made no assumptions about our data. I've never said that x needs to be from a certain distribution, or x needs to be independent, or anything like that. You can take any x, any y, and always get a linear model. But if you want to interpret it, as we're going to look here, we have to make about five or six key assumptions. We're going to look at those after the Vincent break. If those assumptions hold, we can do some powerful things, like say, a confidence interval for my intercept between some lower and upper bound. Or, like I'm teaching in the reactor design course right now, we use these least squares models to find the slope, and that slope is inversely proportional to the rate constant. 
what if, for example, I get the slope, or, or let's say that beta 1 represents the rate constant directly, for ease of, of an example. What if that rate constant was between 0.5 and 1.0? What do you make from that? How would you use that information? So if you, if you did a rate experiment in your batch reactor and you calculate k, my rate constant is between 0.5 and 1. You're like, okay, well, what do I do now? That's a confidence interval for your rate. Okay, you can do a sensitivity analysis on range. Okay, and so you, right, how would that play into a reactor design problem? Right, you get different reactor volumes for, for that, right? So this is giving you balance to play with. This is important because you're doing this lab experiment, you're going to calculate a, a rate of 0.75. Do you go build your reactor using that rate of 0.75? Well, Probably not, if you, especially if you've got this fairly wide confidence interval for it. You do exactly what was suggested here. Do a sensitivity analysis. What is that reactor going to look like if I have a value of 0.5 or a value of 1? Right? And design different worst case and best case scenarios and then the average case scenario. So these confidence intervals are really, really important. We'll get to that soon. And then also when we want to make predictions, we'd like to have balance in our predictions as well. So let's focus on this first part here today, is how well is this model performing? <clears throat> so we saw this uh, graphic at the start of the, of the course. And I said to you, life is pretty boring without any variation. Flat lines, we wouldn't be employed as engineers really. Uh, if our plants were able to produce product day in and day out with no variance, there's really little need for engineers. So, we have variance. We want to understand what that variance is doing. We introduced this awful word that you probably have nightmares from your undergrad courses of analysis of variance. These are NOVA tables that professors always throw in exams and ask you to interpret. Let's take a look at what that analysis of variance table is actually doing and break it down. Okay, it's very, very straightforward to understand and it's crucial to understand if we want to interpret what our school is doing. So, let me put it out there that we could build we can build our model and we can break it down into three parts. The first part is where we actually build what I call no model. <coughs> Counterintuitive, but let's take a look at that. If I've got a data set of X and Y, so I'm going to build up two graphs over this class over here. So you might want to take this board down and that board down in a minute. The first base case is the case of no model. So if my raw data looks something like this, I plotted them up. What's the best model you could fit to those data? Horizontal line. And it's a perfectly valid model. There's been many instances where I've built these types of models. So probably the best model you can fit here is y hat is equal to beta 0. Just a constant is beta, uh, b0, I should say. And one other thing we said about our models, we proved that the model will always pass through x bar, y bar. So here's my x bar. The model will pass through x bar, y bar. Y bar is that same red line. So actually, it's the mean. So if, if someone asked you, given this value of x, what is your best prediction of y? Here's my new x. What's the best prediction of y? It's the average. Okay, the best prediction I can make for that is the average. And that happens in many cases where we just have so much variability that there is no systematic structure there. The best model we can make is to predict the mean of the data. That's what I call the do-nothing case or the no-model case. I shouldn't be that specific because it really is a model. It is a model of y hat is equal to b0 or just an intercept only, only model. 
The next model we can build is a little bit more sophisticated. If, just, if warranted, we can go at a slope. So now we go from B0 to B0 plus B1x4. Now, variance. Variance, the formula for variance you're comfortable with, looks something like x minus x bar. So you take an individual x to sum and square them and divide through by some degrees of freedom. Variance is always relative to some base case. Always quantified as deviations from the mean. Right? what variance is, okay? So, if our model was, had no, was just a flat line, a flat line is the mean, there is no variance from it, okay? So, there's really only variance due to the model and variance due to the residuals. There's no variance due to doing nothing. <coughs> So let's take a look at the analysis of variance table. And to understand the analysis of variance table, let's get this geometric picture in our minds. So we're, we're very comfortable with this, but let's just get our terminology on the same. Here's my regression line. There's, there's obviously a whole lot of data points that I use to find that regression line. I'm not showing them. I'm only showing you one data point, x, i, y, i. And this model passes through this point x bar y bar. So that's my pivot point over here, x bar y bar. So if I fitted a model y hat is equal to y bar, it would just be a horizontal line at that point. But I haven't fit that type of model. In this case, I fit a model with a slope that's non-zero. So what I will call is my total sum of squares is this difference from the actual y to y bar. So that distance, yi minus y bar, is the total distance. My prediction of y, given only xi, so if I only know xi and I predict y, is going to be a point on that position over there. So y hat i so I've, I've labeled it over here. Y hat i, this is called my regression distance. So this distance from y hat to y bar is my regression distance. And then the remaining distance is my residual distance. So 
three distances here. Distances always have sign. So my convention is to take from yi minus y bar. That's my total distance. That's made up of two parts. Mm -hmm. The regression distance from y hat to y bar, and then the residual distance from y actual, yi in other words, to y hat. So we know then that the total sum of the total distance, yi minus y bar, that's my total distance, yi minus y bar, is equal to the sum of those other two distances, y hat minus y bar, so y hat minus y bar, plus y minus y hat. So that first line is nothing more than the physical statement, and it does take sign into account. You, will, you can prove and must prove to yourself at home, if you redraw that figure and you move this point below the regression line, that that statement up there still holds. Because distance has sign. Okay, so it will hold as well. I'm just illustrating it one way above the line. But please prove to yourself that that first statement holds no matter if the point is above or below the line. Next line, very easy, square both sides. So square the right hand and left hand side. The right hand side expands into a messy quadratic. And simplifies as shown in the third line. So once we have this now, the second line, this is for every data point. I can write the second line. So notice the subscript lines everywhere. Take those distances and sum them for every data point. I have n, n such data points. So n distances. So here's the total distance represented for a single data point. But I'm going to go, go sum those equivalent distances for multiple points in my data set and sum them up. So now I'm getting the total sum of squares. That's what they say. Is equal to two parts. The regression sum of squares. This distance due to the going from your baseline, y bar, to the regression line. So that's my regression distance, sum of squares. Plus, there's always going to be the residual sum of squares distance. So this statement, the third and fourth line, is describing something that's intuitive on a geometric level. That the sums of distances squared will break down into two parts. The regression sum of squares and the residual sum of squares. And that's all of the analysis of variance table is doing for us. It's saying, given the total variability in my data set, how much of it can be attributed to the regression, and how much of it can be attributed to the residuals. So with that said, let's take a look at what the analysis of variance table looks like. And then I'm going to ask you to spend a few minutes to fill in an analysis of variance table for these two extremes, for the worst case and for the best case. So you're going to build two little analysis of various tables in a minute to see what those numbers look like in the table. Every other analysis of various table you'll ever look at is going to be somewhere between those two extremes. So fairly straightforward, the analysis of various table says, let's break down the variance due to the regression. We call that y hat minus y bar. And let's have a line for the variance due to the residuals, y minus y hat. So we're comfortable with the residuals as being y minus y hat. The regression distance may not be so comfortable to use y hat minus y bar, but it's simply that y hat minus y bar. So how much is the distance to taking from my base case, y bar, to the regression line? And then the total variance, or total distance, is y minus y bar. That's the, the sum of those two. Now, we have the concept of degrees of freedom here. There are two degrees of freedom associated with the regression model, because I have to fit a slope and an intercept. I require to use my data to find those slope and intercept, so I've removed two degrees of variance, or two degrees of freedom, I should say, to calculate that. So I've reduced by that two degrees of, I would consume two degrees of freedom to compute my model. The residuals are then, I have n data points minus those two degrees
degrees of freedom to get me a total of n degrees of freedom. So I've got n data points, n degrees of freedom total. Two of them are consumed by building the model, V0 and V1, and the remaining are due to the residuals. Okay. In the next few classes, when we start to add three or four terms to the model, that degrees of freedom will go up. But for now, it's equal to two, which is about two parameters. So what I'd like you to do now is to construct this analysis of various tables and only fill in what you would think is the regression sum of squares, residual sum of squares, and total sum of squares for these cases. So the, re the regression sum of squares is what would you think would be the value for regression sum of squares, residual sum of squares, and total sum of squares for these two cases. So do something like this on your page. Um, Regression sum of squares, residual sum of squares, total sum of squares. What would you put those numbers as? For this case, which is your next case, and then this worst case. So spend a few minutes uh, talking to the next to you, describe what those sums of squares are doing and what those numbers might be. value is exactly equal to the predicted value, so that's a whole sum of zeros. So residual sum of squares is zero. 
what is the regression sum of squares? Y hat minus Y bar. I don't need an exact number. So let's take a look at it geometrically. Y hat minus Y bar. So Y hat is the point on the line. Y bar is over here. So I'm taking that distance and summing it, uh, squaring it, adding that distance, squaring it, summing it, plus that one, plus plus that distance squared, plus that distance squared, plus that distance squared. That distance squared. So regression sum of squares is just going to be some large value. So I'm just going to call it L, some large number L. It's just the sum of that distance squared plus that distance squared, 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 squared. So that you're adding a whole lot of positive numbers together. What about total sum of squares? Yeah, no, you just. Oh, L. It's L. It's also, it's the same large L. Because it's Y minus Y bar. And Y minus Y bar is that same distance, squared, 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 squared. So the key thing here is that, let me write this a little clearer, that sum large L, this is the same large L, that my regression sum of squares is equal to my total sum of squares. And my residual sum of squares is zero for the best case. So a perfect model will have this characteristic on the analysis of variance table. Let's take a look at this model. That's not doing very well at all. The best you could do is fit a horizontal line. What's regression sum of squares here? Y hat minus y bar. My position y hat is equal to y bar. So the regression sum of squares is zero. Residual sum of squares. Zero. No. The residual sum of squares is every y minus y hat. So it's this distance squared, every single one of these distances, sum and square them. Again, I'm going to get some large value. Total sum of squares. Total sum of squares is y minus y bar. Is the total sum of squares zero? Total sum of squares is equal to RSS is equal to the same large L. Okay. Y minus y bar. Y minus y bar, y minus y bar, y bar and y hat are identical. So I'm going to get the same number that I calculate for residual sum of squares as I get for total sum of squares. Okay. So my analysis of variance table is these two extremes. Every other model is somewhere in between. So in the one model, I have zero for regression sum of squares. When my model is unable to do anything, my regression sum of squares is zero. When my model is able to perform perfectly, that number goes up to one. And then this number, RSS, drops down to zero. All other models trade off in between that. So one way we, we look at that is to look at that ratio. So we look at this ratio, regression sum of squares over total sum of squares, to try and quantify that level of trade off. So what is it over here? Regression sum of squares over total sum of squares. Total sum of squares is always going to be big. Right? It's always going to be the sum of squares of all your lengths. Regression sum of squares is always going to be at least equal to total sum of squares or smaller. So this ratio is always going to be below uh, 1 or equal to 1. So in this case, it's equal to 1. Regression sum of squares is equal to total sum of squares. The ratio over here
doesn't matter how many sum of squares we've got, our total sum of squares, because my numerator is zero, zero divided by a big number is zero. Two extremes. We go from a zero here to a one over there. Now can you guess what r squared is? R squared is regression sum of squares or total sum of squares. Okay? That's equal to R squared. That's all that R squared tells you is how far are you between these two cases of perfect fit versus no fit. Okay, so this is what an R squared of zero looks like. R squared of zero is a flat line that passes through your data points. Now hang on, I said at the start of the class that I can compute R squared without <coughs> building a model. This analysis that I did here requires a model. I need to know what V0 and V1 are in order to calculate my residual sum of squares. Okay, so I wasn't lying to you. It really is possible to find R squared without a model. And I'll get to that in a minute. But let's just uh, finish up here talking a bit about R squared is this ratio between regression sum of squares and total sum of squares. Let's talk about regression sum of squares. It's the variance we can explain with the model. It's how much of the variability can be accounted for by using the model. Total sum of squares is the variance that we started off with. And we've broken it down into two parts. How much we can explain with the model and how much remains in the residuals, RSS. <coughs> I just want to come back to this concept of those sums of squares as a variance concept. I, I, got, I didn't talk about this last column. This last column is something you always see in the analysis of variance tables. It's a mean, called the mean square column. And the one way you can interpret the mean square is it's a variance. This is a sum of squares. If I take sums of squares and I divide it through by the degrees of freedom, that gets me a variance. I had that formula up on the board there earlier on. Take the sums of squares, divide it through by the degrees of freedom, that gets me a variance-like number. So this is the variance over here that's attributable to the model. This is the variance that's attributable to the residuals. So in this model over here on the left-hand side, where residual sum of squares is zero, there's no variability in my residuals because RSS is zero. This model over here, RSS is huge. It's, in fact, it's the greatest amount of variance you can ever get because RSS is just some large value. You can never get a value larger than this because by definition, this number zero plus this value must sum up to this. So I can't get a variance in the second line that exceeds this final line because this is the total of the two. So there's no greater variance greater than this one. So this final column in an analysis of variance table, the mean square column, should be interpreted as a variance. Or if you're more comfortable as I am working with standard deviations, take the square root of it. And then these become standard deviations. The standard deviations of the residuals. We're going to talk about that next. That's the standard deviations of my residuals for the next class, I should say. So let me, let me just quickly show you here a little bit of the, that interesting factor of R squared. R squared can be, can be written as follows. R, the correlation between X and Y. If I use the formula we looked at on in class on Wednesday, it's X minus X bar, Y minus Y bar, divided by the variance of X, variance of Y, and take the square root of that. So the numerator here is covariance of X with Y, divided through by the square product of the variances. If I take that R value, that's why I called it lowercase r, and I square it, now I get capital R squared, which will be a number that ranges between 0 and 1. So an R squared of 0 tells me there's no correlation between x and y. It's shown here. This is no correlation between x and y. This case over here is this perfect correlation between x and y. I'm going to get an R squared of 1. Now, was it last year or the year before? I was looking at that formula myself and I was like, holy shit, there's no model in there. Like, there's no y hat. There's no beta 0, no beta b0, no b1. 
all this relies on is x and y. I've never seen this in any of Stack's books pointed out, but I was like, I can calculate r squared without filling the model. But that's the definition of r squared up there. If I look at this definition of r squared, absolutely I need the model, because I need to calculate my residual sum of squares. Why? I need to know my y hats. Okay, so that implies I know my model. But this definition of r squared is equally valid. And it tells me I can calculate r squared without the model. That totally makes you realize how almost meaningless r squared is as a metric to quantify how good a model is. Because I can find it without even fitting a model. Why is everybody telling you that the force is Why? I have no idea. It's just one of those things that people use and it becomes ingrained. Okay, so it's this is what I want you to take away from today's class. R squared can be calculated without filling a model. So if someone tells you what's your R squared, point this out. But here's the key thing. R squared is abused as a way to measure how good your model is. I started off the class by asking you, is R squared of 0.6 a good value? And you all nodded your head, or many of you nodded your heads. No, it's absolutely not. R squared of, I've seen R squared that are on, in the order of magnitude of 30 to 40, and they've been phenomenally powerful predictors, because they predicted stuff we didn't know otherwise. So it's totally bogus to say you need an R squared above a certain amount in order to be a good model. No, absolutely no. What you do need to quantify how good a model is, is almost never related to R squared value. R squared simply tells you how strongly correlated two variables are. That's all it's doing. Goodness of judge or goodness of a model is judged by other criteria. What if I bring in new testing data that I did not use to build the model, and I use that and check the predictions of observers predicted on those testing data? That's a way to tell that the model works. Because then the model is serving its purpose to make predictions for you. We'll talk a bit about cross-validation and randomization, where I mix up my data and I cross-validate my model. I omit some data, fit my model, predict. I omit data, fit the model, predict other data. And I cycle through them until I get an estimate of the model's predictive ability. At the end of this section, I'll talk a bit about cross-validation. So what we'll learn about after the midterm break, but I'll put this out there, is that the best way to judge a model's performance is to use what's the standard error. And the standard error is nothing more than the variance of the residuals. So take a look at this formula over here. In the analysis of the variance table, we're going to use that to residual sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. We're going to take the square root of that, pull out the standard error. That number is going to tell you how good the model is. So we'll take a look at this after the midterm.